Before I begin the seminar though today, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, um, the Widjibal Wiyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation. Of course, that's where I'm seated. There may be people seated in many other parts of Australia. So um, I'd like to just extend um, our respects to wherever you're, you're seated and get to live and work. Um, I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend that respect to any other Indigenous um, people who are present on our, on our seminar. Um, for anyone that's a, a tweeter, you can see our Twitter handle is um, placed there on the, the introductory slide. And it just takes a while to go through these. So in terms of just housekeeping, um, Larissa has told me that her presentation goes for 33 minutes and 20 seconds, which is quite precise. <laughs> um, but so during that time, if you could just keep your uh, microphone muted. Um, and the seminar is being video and audio recorded. Um, and at the end, we'll make sure that there's uh, time for questions at the end of the presentation. And just a, a put in your diary is uh, on the 15th of October, um, Ross Bailey and myself are presenting a framework to evaluate and understand access to healthcare in the, in the Northern Rivers. So um, if you'd like to pop that one next seminar in your diaries. So um, I'd just like to um, present, uh, well, it's now Dr. Larissa Barnes. Um, and, and thank Larissa for um, agreeing to present at one of these seminars. Um, the bio here says that Larissa is a PhD candidate, so it's a newly freshly minted PhD, so congratulations. And um, Larissa um, submitted her thesis in February this year. Um, Larissa is a, a naturopath and a researcher by profession, and she studied under the um, supervision of Professor Aslani, uh, Leslie, Barca, Leslie Barclay and, and Kirsten McCaffrey at the University of Sydney. Larissa is passionate about supporting women to make informed choices regarding their health and furthering research into complementary medicine. Larissa has worked as a clinical educator at Southern Cross University and was in naturopathic practice for 17 years. And luckily, lucky for us at the UCRH, Larissa is currently working with us and um, she works in the area of multidisciplinary uh, education and is also currently a unit writer for Southern Cross University at the National Centre for Naturopathic Medicine. So if I just would like to hand over to you, Larissa, I'll just stop sharing. Thanks, Jodie. Thanks for that warm welcome. And I will pop my uh, my presentation up now. Well. So, it's a little bit tricky with Zoom across three screens. So let me see if I can share this one. Number one. Can you see the title slide for my presentation now? Was that a thumbs up? Yeah, excellent. Okay, great. Now I have to get it to show me my note slide. Sorry, it's just decided to change screens, I think. Can you still see So a bit frustrating. Larissa, I can, we can see. You can see my screen? Correct. Okay, because it's pointing, on well, my screen is pointing to me, not the screen. <laughs> we, I can see your presentation. Great. Okay, thanks for confirming, Jody. Okay, well, um, thank you for having me, everyone, here today. It's a pleasure to share my research with you and to have so many people interested in what I've been actually immersing myself in for the last five years or more. As um, Jodie introduced, my name is Larissa Barnes and I recently completed my PhD. Um, my research focused on women's use of complementary medicine products in pregnancy and lactation. And today I'm presenting key results from a national survey that was part of my PhD research. 
and I did my PhD under the supervision of Professor Parisa Aslani at the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy. And I note that Parisa has joined us today. Hi, Parisa, thanks for being here. And also under the co-supervision from Professors Kirsten McCaffrey and Leslie Barclay at the Sydney School of Public Health. And Leslie was also a director here at the University Centre for Rural Health when I first started. I'd also just like to acknowledge Dr. Margaret Wolf. She's a colleague and a biostatistician, and she helped a lot with the design and the actual analysis of the survey data. And so she'll be a co-author on all those papers. I've been a distance student for all my candidature, working and researching from the University of Sydney's University Centre for Rural Health, which is in Lismore. And um, so I've worked at a distance from my supervisors, but I still very much appreciate everything that they've done for me. Before I begin my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge that I primarily conducted the research for my PhD on Bundjalung country. And I acknowledge the Wijibal, Wyabal people of the Bundjalung nation as the traditional owners of the land on which I work, live and play. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging from all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander countries and all those people joining us today who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. I also acknowledge that my supervisors supported me while working from Eora country and I'd like to thank and acknowledge the women from all over Australia who participated in my survey and all people attending here from the many different Aboriginal lands across Australia. I undertook three types of research over the course of my PhD and I'll just briefly mention them as the projects I completed earlier in my candidature influenced the design of the survey that I'm focusing on today. So I did a, a narrative literature review and what was obvious in the literature was that most of it had been written from the point of view of the people, processes and policies of the health literacy environment. That is healthcare practitioners and people who write health policy. There was a strong need to understand women's voices, the women consumers who were using complementary medicine products in pregnancy and lactation. Their actual skills and abilities had not been fully explored and had not been um, published. So I did some systematic review research, and in that I looked at the types of complementary medicine products that mothers use for the benefit for themselves, the pregnancy, the child, and all the breastfeeding process, and the information sources they accessed around these. I also did quite a large qualitative research project involving focus group discussions and individual interviews with 25 different um, pregnant or breastfeeding mothers. They were all currently using complementary medicine products at the time of the research, and they lived across metropolitan Sydney, Southeast Queensland and the Northern Rivers. Now, both the systematic review research and qualitative research informed the design of the survey that I'm focusing on today. This was a cross-sectional self-administrated questionnaire and it aimed to test whether some of the factors that I'd identified, especially in the qualitative research, those factors that influence women's decisions to take a complementary medicine product in pregnancy or lactation. I wanted to see if they could be actually found in a larger group of women. And I also investigated their health beliefs in the survey. So before going any further, I think it's really useful to explain some of the operational definitions for, I used over the course of my research. And I focused on complementary medicine products rather than therapies. Now that was partly because I'm in the School of Pharmacy and um, partly because it helped define my research project. Now, the use of complementary medicine products as medicines, of course, is going to be of a, a little bit more concern um, to a lot of healthcare professionals, perhaps than women's engagement with complementary me medicine therapies like massage therapy. And that's because they're taking them as medicines and they may interact either with um, the baby and the development of the baby or the breast milk or other medications they're on. So my definition of CMPs or complementary medicine products were ingested herbal medicines given for specific therapeutic purposes. So that could be in a tea, tablet, capsule, decoction, ethanolic extract, herbal washes, and then micronutrient supplements like vitamin and mineral supplements and pre and probiotic supplements. Also the definition of maternal health literacy was central to my use research and Renkit and Nutbeam came up with this definition back in 2001 and maternal health literacy is defined as the cognitive and social skills that determine the motivation and ability of women to gain access to, to understand and to use information in ways that promote and maintain their own health and that of their children. 
So this definition was central to my research in exploring women's information seeking and their decision making regarding CMP use in pregnancy and lactation. So back to the survey, as I said before, the aim was to see if results from the qualitative study could be found in a larger sample of Australian pregnant and breastfeeding women. We identified five main factors in the qualitative study that informed the design of the survey. And those factors were whether women considered the safety and potential benefits before taking a CMP, the information sources that they accessed, and also the influence of health literacy on their decision making. And I added in um, the health locus of control theory to examine to respondents' personal beliefs about who was responsible for their pregnancy and breastfeeding health and wellbeing. So I'll present my conclusions first, because it's quite fun often to have the juicy part presented first, and then I'll show you how I came to these. So what did my research show? Basically that women are smart. Considerations of safety were central to the information seeking and decision making. They wanted what's safe for their babies and themselves. They searched widely for information in order to make informed decisions. And they said they'd take a CMP, a complementary medicine product, if they perceived it to be safe and have benefit for themselves or their babies. They really wanted information about their CMPs from trusted healthcare practitioners. And then they corroborated that information with other information they actively searched for from published research, hospital and government information. Yes, they did talk to their family and friends and Googled, but they didn't trust this information as much as that they got from their healthcare practitioners. So my methods, my survey instrument was a cross-sectional self-administered anonymous online questionnaire. And the women that completed it were very motivated because it was a long questionnaire. It was 20 minutes and about 70 questions. To be eligible, you had to be a woman living in Australia, currently pregnant or breastfeeding, taking complementary medicine products and be over 18 years of age. Now I used some principles from statistical research to calculate reasonable sample sizes for each group. This included examining published cross-sectional research on each study outcome variable to determine minimum and maximum prevalence. I also looked at data regarding women's uses of complementary medicine products in pregnancy and lactation. Now, we knew the sample couldn't be considered a representative sample, but we did aim for sample sizes based on these sample size calculations. Recruitment to the survey research was entirely online and primarily through Facebook, although I did advertise it on Gumtree, and I also advertised through the University of Sydney Yammer, which is an online electronic communication platform. The survey itself was hosted on the Qualtrics platform, and it included questions to record respondents' demographics and various types of questions to answer the survey objectives. So checklists of complementary medicine products, information and recommendation sources. There were some free text questions and like it scale to measure agreement and disagreement about safety and benefits. A few yes, no, and some ranking questions as I'll discuss further. Now we did examine women's personal beliefs about health using the multidimensional health locus of control scale form C very long name. Now this is a validated 18 item questionnaire and it contains 18 health belief statements that relate to four scales that indicate where a person feels control of their health lies. And every person has a different proportion of each dimension. These are the four scales here and they relate to whether somebody feels they themselves have control of their health and that's the internal scale, whether chance controls their health, healthcare practitioners or powerful other people which it can be people like mothers-in-law, not healthcare practitioners. Um, an example of the statement testing, one of them testing internal health locus of controls on the slide now. And that is, if my health and well-being during pregnancy worsens, it's my own behaviour which determines how well, how soon I will feel better again. So respondents indicated their agreement with this statement on this one to six scale. And then what we did was score all the, in, all the statement scores together for each person and then calculated the frequency statistics for each internal scale for the whole sample. And then we were able to calculate the means for both cohorts and compare the, 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 where the health locus of control scores were for the pregnancy cohort as for the breastfeeding cohort and all together. And we included this because the qualitative data strongly indicated that participants had strong beliefs in their own abilities to control and be responsible for their health. 
but they also felt great trust in their healthcare practitioners to guide them in their complementary medicine product use. And we wanted to see if similar health beliefs could be found in a larger sample of women. So in the qualitative research, I hadn't actually used this questionnaire, but when I found it, I was quite excited to be able to test it with a validated questionnaire and a large sample. Statistical analyses involve descriptive statistics for all the demographic information and the results of the health literacy tests and chi-square tests to look at differences between the pregnant and breastfeeding cohorts. We did some principal component analysis to look at whether perceptions of safety and benefits regarding CMP use in pregnancy and lactation were components of the respondents' decision making. And repeated measures of ANOVA tests were used to look at the differences in the mean scores of those health focus and control scales for the two cohorts. And we set significance at P is less than 0.05 for all of those extra analyses. Now, participants were recruited to the survey um, through both purposive and snowball recruitment over a 10 week period. I set up a Facebook page specific to the research project. I've got a screenshot of the top of the page there. Um, and you note the University of Sydney logo, the photographs of the women from different cultural backgrounds um, and complementary medicine products. So all the posts and photos that appeared on the page were approved by the ethics committee at Sydney University and every post had a link to the survey in the Qualtrics platform. So women could click on the post, read about it, then click on the link and choose to participate. I also paid Facebook to promote 14 posts over that 10 week period. And that meant they displayed that post on potential um, participants' Facebook feeds. So it was like a paid ad. And, um, and then women could see that and again, click on it if they were interested and go for more information on the Qualtrics page. I also requested administrators of 118 different Facebook pages to promote the posts for me and post them on there. I did that through private message. And, um, and that also worked to really help increase recruitment. And I monitored the page quite closely over the 10 weeks and noted when people liked, loved, shared and tagged other people, thanked people. We sh the whole research team shared it through their social network connections. It's quite an interesting experience being on Facebook that intensively for 10 weeks and yet actually being doing a PhD. <laughs> now in Facebook with the promoted post, you can actually define the audience that you want to see those posts. And I found that the most successful one that generated the most recruitment was simply asking Facebook to post it on women's pages who lived in Australia who were aged between 18 and 45. Um, so overall, I got 1,418 responses and over those 810 were complete and they were used in the final analysis. If anybody wants to know more information about using Facebook, I have written up my methods in a methods paper and that's been published recently in Research in Social and Administrative Pharmacy. So these are some of, some of the demographics of the survey participants. Now, although, as I said before, they were purposefully recruited and therefore the sample isn't representative, it is interesting to note that their demographics are fairly close to what previous research has shown about Australian women who use complementary medicine products in pregnancy and lactation. That is our impermanent relationships, tertiary educated, mainly English speaking and predominantly non-smokers and most had medium to high incomes. I didn't specifically inquire about ethnic diversity, although I did ask where, what country a woman was born in and what country her parents were born in. And about a third of the respondents had at least one parent born overseas. Women from all over Australia participated, predominantly from the Eastern states and participation approximately matched population distribution. So that was great, it was definitely a national survey. I wanted to include a measure of rurality in my survey as studies vary. So some previous studies have found that complementary medicine use is more associated with being an, a rural dwelling person and others have found that it's more associated with being an urban dwelling person. And I didn't get enough rural participants really to test this statistically, but it was great to see that women from all different regions of Australia participated. And as you can see, most were from major cities in Australia but about a fifth participated from inner, inner regional areas. So if you know the Lismore area, we're considered an inner regional area, for example. I included two validated health literacy tests in the survey. This was the first one. It's a single item health literacy screening test that's often used in clinical practice. And you simply ask a person, how confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? 
Now, if they answer that they're not at all a little bit or somewhat confident, they're considered at risk of limited health literacy. And as you can see, only 3.8% of my sample were at risk of limited health literacy. Conversely, if they answer that they're quite a bit or extremely confident in filling out medical forms by themselves, they're considered not at risk. And 96.2% of my sample weren't at risk of limited health literacy. The second validated test I used to measure health literacy was the newest vital sign. And we chose this test because it measures functional health literacy. Now what functional health literacy does is it refers to the ability to obtain and understand factual health information. So this test actually uses a label from an ice cream carton and respondents are asked to answer six questions and they need to use their literacy and numeracy skills to interpret the information on the label when they're answering. And this validated health literacy test was the closest we could find to testing out how women may understand and interpret information on a nutritional label that may appear in a complementary medicine product, for example. It was quite tricky. People often don't like this test, especially because of the numeracy. But what we found was that the majority of the respondents, so 93.3%, had adequate functional health literacy skills. That means they answered four to six questions out of the six correctly. Now, I explained earlier how the means for each subscale on the multidimensional health locus of control form C were calculated and brought back to the original one to six scales, and that we did a repeated measures of ANOVA analysis. And this figure illustrates the mean scores for the pregnant cohort in blue and the breastfeeding cohort in red for each of those four score, uh, sorry, four subscales, the internal chance, healthcare practitioner and other people. So for the whole sample, healthcare practitioners, health locus of control had the highest mean score followed by internal health locus of control. And both chance and other people mean scores considerably lower. Now these results indicate that the whole sample felt that healthcare practitioners had substantial control over their pregnancy or breastfeeding health, although this was significantly higher for the pregnant cohort. But these quite high internal health locus of control scores also indicate that the whole sample had strong beliefs in their own abilities to control their health, although this was significantly higher for the breastfeeding cohort. And although the mean scores for the chance health locus of control were a lot lower than those others, significantly more pregnant respondents felt that chance or fate influenced their health compared to the breastfeeding respondents. And the other people health locus of control results show that the whole sample did not feel that other people had significant control over their pregnancy or breastfeeding health. So women reported taking dietary supplements and herbal medicines. They were the main, main groups that were reported in this survey. Dietary supplement was far more, use was far more common than herbal medicine use. But for those women who did use herbal medicines, it was more common to use them during bre breastfeeding than pregnancy. So 808 of the 810 respondents reported taking at least one um, dietary supplement. And the most popular ones were pregnancy and breastfeeding multivitamins, iron and probiotics. This high use of pregnancy and breastfeeding multivitamins is in line with the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, so RANSCOG's current recommendations. They say that most proprietary pregnancy and lactation multivitamin preparations are adequate for the majority of pregnancies and will cover nutritional needs for vitamin D and folic acid. That is, unless the woman has a diagnosed deficiency and needs extra supplements for that. And so I found that quite interesting that they were so popular to be used. Um, the other uh, dietary supplements reported by the survey respondents, a lot of them are also commonly prescribed or recommended by biomedical healthcare practitioners and naturopaths. But um, these include folic acid for all women preconceptionally and in the first trimester to help prevent neural tube defects. Vitamin D is part of the multivitamin or additionally if there's a diagnosed deficiency for bone health, immune health and pre and postnatal mental health. Now the iodine supplementation was a bit lower than what we'd like, but it is there. And um, that's really important preconceptionally and through pregnancy and lactation to prevent thyroid underactivity, which can also be associated with postnatal depression. And in that RANSCOG document, calcium, iron, vitamin B12 and omega supplement three supplementation are also recommended for women who have dietary deficiencies or deficiencies diagnosed on pathology tests. 
So as I said, only two respondents didn't take a dietary supplement. Most took between one and three. And the averages and the median scores for the pregnant and breastfeeding cohorts were quite similar. And there were no significant differences between the numbers of dietary supplements taken by the pregnant respondents versus the breastfeeding respondents. As I said, herbal medicine use was much lower in both cohorts. 57.3% of the total sample reported using herbal medicines. And of those, um, there were more breastfeeding women than pregnant women who reported using herbal medicines. The most popular herbal medicines reported by the pregnant women were raspberry leaf, followed by ginger, peppermint and chamomile. Now I didn't ask them the form, but they use this medicine, just the name of the herb. The most popular herbs used by breastfeeding women were ginger, chamomile and fenugreek. Now, one key take home message from my PhD is that mothers access a wide variety of information sources regarding the complementary medicine products they use. I noted this in the qualitative and systematic review research and I explored it further in the survey research. So why was it important to identify women's complementary medicines information sources? Well, information seeking to find information to use for the benefit of your own health is a really important component of health literacy. And previous research has raised concerns regarding the safety implications when women self-prescribe CMPs in pregnancy or lactation, and when they rely on lay information sources, so family and friends, rather than healthcare practitioners. But while previous research and the systematic review research identified that women access a ton of different information sources, to our knowledge, women hadn't been asked to rank these information sources to find out which ones they trusted the most. So we assessed this question in the survey. We asked respondents to rank their um, top five CMPs information, in information sources. And um, these are some of the interesting results. So this slide here is actually from one of my systematic reviews and it shows the plethora of information sources that women access regarding their complementary medicine products. And you can put those into six main groups healthcare practitioners, cultural information, community resources, their own knowledge and experience, media and interpersonal relationships, mainly lay sources like family and friends. And the areas that are shaded in blue are all the um, information sources that women in my qualitative study that was conducted here in Australia identified when I asked them where they found out information about complementary medicine products. But when we asked in the survey women to actually rank we, we included all these sources in the survey. We asked them to rank their top five. The ones there in gold are what they ranked. So healthcare practitioners, GPs, obstetricians, midwives, pharmacists, naturopaths and herbalists, and published research were their most trusted sources. That was quite interesting. Um, the survey respondents were also asked to identify their one healthcare practitioner that they most trusted when seeking healthcare for themselves during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And as you can see there in the bottom of the graph, GPs were chosen the most often as the most trusted healthcare prof professional, followed by obstetrician and midwife. There were some significant differences between the two cohorts in their most trusted healthcare practitioners. And this probably relates to those healthcare practitioners they see most often and have access to. So in, in lactation, uh, breastfeeding women said that lactation consultants, pharmacists, child and family health nurses, and naturopaths or herbalists were their most trusted sources. And they, as in significantly more of those breastfeeding women chose those than pregnant women. And in, whereas in pregnancy, significantly more pregnant women chose midwife, obstetrician, and GP. But again, that just may reflect the types of healthcare practitioners women actually have access to during those different times. But a take home message here as well is that the survey respondents were clearly complementary medicine users. They weren't alternative medicine users. And this is obvious by the choice of their most trusted healthcare practitioners are pretty much biomedical. So mainstream biomedical healthcare practitioners. Now there were more healthcare practitioners than is what is shown on the screen asked about. So I did ask about traditional Chinese medicine practitioners. I did ask about nutritionists, all sorts of other practitioners, but these were the top ones that were chosen. Um, the systematic review and qualitative and survey research all identified that women use complementary medicine products to benefit their own and their baby's health. 
And the survey research actually confirmed this that we found in the earlier research, that establishing safety and benefits was really important to participants' decision making. But we wanted to know how women use this information to um, make decisions about using complementary medicine products. So in addition to asking about their most trusted sources of information, we asked a series of questions in the survey to see how women judged a CMP safety. And one of them was they were asked if they believed a complementary medicine product was safe if various healthcare professionals, print or online media, or lay sources said it was safe and they assessed their agreement on like at scales. So respondents trusted the judgment of the healthcare practitioners and they relied on information from published research, hospital and government health information. They rang medication helplines and looked up medication websites. But they did not rely on members of their social circles or using several general internet sites when determining the safety of a complementary medicine product in pregnancy and lactation for their unborn or breastfeeding babies. But we also asked this, they didn't rely on those for their own health either. So we did the principal component analysis. And I know this is a bit of a complex slide, but I will walk you through it. We obtained three factors um, for safety in pregnancy. This first factor here explored women's beliefs about the complementary medicine products they took in pregnancy and safety for the baby, the pregnant mother, and whether they felt that their complementary medicine products helped women have healthy pregnancies. The second factor explained whether women felt CMPs were more safe or more natural to use than pharmaceutical medications. And the third factor explored whether they had concerns about the safety of those CMPs they actually used. And the PCA analysis confirmed that establishing the safety regarding CMP use was an important component of decision-making for the pregnant respondents and accounted for 80.2% of the variance for pregnant women. So similarly, we looked at safety and CMP use in breastfeeding and we found um, three factors again. The first factor, safety, explored women's beliefs about the CMPs they took for their own safety, the breastfeeding baby, and whether they felt it helped them breastfeed successfully. The second factor explored whether women felt CMPs were safer or more natural to use than pharmaceutical medications. And the third factor explored whether they had any concerns about the CMPs. And again, the PCAA analysis confirmed that establishing the safety regarding CMP use was an important component of women's decision-making for the breastfeeding respondents and accounted for 74.3% of the variance for these women. We also wanted to look at the benefits, women's perceptions of benefits of using CMP use in both pregnancy and lactation. And regarding pregnancy, we found one factor and um, this indicated that women consider the benefits to the pregnancy, the unborn baby and their own health when deciding to use CMPs in pregnancy. And the PCA analysis confirmed that establishing perceived benefits regarding the CMP use was an important component of their decision-making for the pregnant respondents and accounted for 68.9% of the variance. In breastfeeding, when we looked at the benefits or perceived benefits, we found two factors. Um, the first was benefits. Women took the CMPs to help the breastfeeding process and their babies. And the second we called considerations. Women considered possible harms to their babies, their breast milk supply and their own health when deciding to use CMPs in breastfeeding. And the PCA analysis confirmed that establishing perceived benefits regarding CMP use during lactation was an important component of the breastfeeding respondents decision making. Um, in this survey. It accounted for 64.8% of the variance for breastfeeding women. Now regarding perceived benefits further, we also asked survey respondents why they took CMPs. And for the whole sample for dietary supplements, overall the most cited reasons were to help my baby grow healthily, to help me get all the nutrition I need to be healthy and to help me stay healthy. There were some differences between the pregnant and breastfeeding cohorts. Now they could choose more than one option here, but we did do um, the chi-score analysis and we found that significantly more pregnant respondents reported that they took their supplements to help my baby grow healthily and because their healthcare practitioner prescribed them than the breastfeeding respondents. Now their reasons for taking herbal medicines, remember it was only I'd just over half of the, of the whole sample took herbal medicines. And of those that did take them, their most common reasons were to help my baby grow healthily and to help me stay healthily. 
And it's interesting that only 8.4% of the sample, so 39 women, reported using herbal medicines because their healthcare practitioner prescribed them. So there was a lot more self-prescription of herbal medicines going on potentially than for than, um, dietary supplements. Now, I also asked women, um, they could fill in another reason with free text option for why they took herbal medicines. And I coded this and it revealed that six and a half percent of the pregnant respondents who used herbal medicines were using them to prepare for labour and birth. And 9.6% of the breastfeeding respondents reported taking herbal medicines to stimulate their breast milk supply. Now, these are interesting results because previous research has found a lot larger proportions of women using herbal medicines in pregnancy to prepare for labour. And definitely, like, there was a Western Australian survey that found, like, more around 60% of women using herbs in breastfeeding were using them to stimulate their breast milk supply. And so th this wasn't the case for my sample. So I presented my conclusions earlier, but I'll reiterate them here. Women are smart. They want what's safe for their babies and themselves and they search widely for information in order to make informed decisions. And they'll take CMPs if they perceive them to be safe and have benefit to themselves or their babies. They really want information from their trusted healthcare practitioners about the CMPs they're considering. And they then match this information with other information they have to actively search for. You actually do have to actively search for in published research and read through hospital and government information and go on websites to try to find it. Yes, they Google and talk to their family and friends, but they don't trust this information as much as information they get from their healthcare practitioners. Now, going back to the concept of maternal health literacy, it's apparent from the survey that women were making decisions about their complementary medicine products in line with the concept of maternal health literacy. That is because they wanted to promote and maintain their own health and the health of their children. And the survey results regarding the health focus of control beliefs show that women trust their healthcare practitioners and also have high internal health focus of control beliefs, which contribute to their significant autonomy in healthcare decision making, including their wide searches for information and their evaluations of whether CMPs are safe or beneficial. So I'd like to really acknowledge the 1,443 total participants who participated in my research, as well as all those people who shared it. My supervisors, um, I've got a multidisciplinary team I've been working with. Parisa's a pharmacist, Leslie's a midwife, and Kirsten's um, in public health and her psychology background. Um, Dr. Margaret Rolfe was invaluable in helping with the data analysis. And I'd like to thank the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy and the University Centre of Rural Health here in Lismore for supporting me all the way through. Early in my candidature, I received a scholarship from Blackmores. Now this was philanthropic funding. They had no input into the design or dissemination of my research, but that financial funding really helped the first few years. Thank you, Blackmores. And especially big thanks to my family for supporting me all the way. And I'll open up now to questions and comments. My audio. Can I just make a comment? I just love where it got to because having worked as a health practitioner for decades and heard from people that women are not smart, they'll, they'll listen, they won't take notice of other people. This, these, this data was just gorgeous for me because it, it demonstrated how carefully, thoughtfully and safely women acted. And, um, you know, the few people who denigrated women and their smartness and their capacity to make sensible decisions are totally, you know, discombobulated by this fabulous research. So it was great to be part of it. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks for your support. So Leslie was one of my supervisors, for those of you who don't know. Um, I was just trying to open up the chat so I can see if there were any questions in there. Um, somebody asked if they could have a copy of the slides. Um, the seminar will be recorded, but some of the um, information hasn't actually been published yet. So I prefer not to share the, the slides just yet, but I will, um, we will put on um, out when the actual um, papers come out. Um, so that's one of them. Just scrolling through. Larissa, can I ask a question, please? Sure, yeah. sure, JD. Um, Larissa, I was particularly interested in your strategy of utilising Facebook for your recruitment um, 
for your survey respondents. Yeah. Um, and you obviously did a, a fantastic job to get um, so many respondents. I was wondering whether at what point people dropped out of the survey, because I think you mentioned that you had about 800 full, um, so people responded to the full set of survey questions, about 800 people did. And did people drop out when they had to do the health literacy question? No, and that was something that I was very nervous about. So mm -hmm. what, what we did was um, we left it in there thinking, oh, you know, this might discourage people. But what we did was we, we piloted the survey first. Um, and then we also looked at the first, I think, 20 or 30 responses to see if people were completing that section. And they were. Um, the only compulsory questions in the whole survey were the first questions at the very beginning, which screened out people that were really interested but weren't 18 and over, weren't pregnant, weren't breastfeeding, weren't using um, confidential medicine products and weren't a woman. So um, everything else wasn't, wasn't compulsory to finish, but we were very gratified that people actually did complete, complete it. And no, the health literacy screening questions didn't seem to put people off. Hmm. <laughs> Larissa, I, I have a question. Thank you. That was such an interesting and beautifully presented <laughs> presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, my, so my question really is that there's, there's so much um, about what you've told us today that has implications for healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder what, what the implications are in terms of their knowledge base and confidence and skills around ad advising and supporting women about CMPs? Because obviously for the women, the healthcare practitioners are really key. Yeah, so that's a really good question, Jo, because of course the survey was all looking, and the other research pretty much all looking at women's voices. And women do want their healthcare practitioners to be informed. Um, a lot of them did cite a complementary medicine practitioner as an information source, even though they might have had um, their GP as their most trusted. So I think it really comes down to a lot more communication between healthcare practitioners and willingness to work together and put the woman at the centre of care. So we, the, the term woman-centred care is used a lot in midwifery and patient-centred care wider. But if you look at what a woman's healthcare goals are and where she wants to go and how she wants to meet those, you can use your own expertise to help guide her and answer questions but you also need to talk to the other healthcare practitioners that are in her team. I think it's really important for healthcare practitioners to understand that women are searching so widely for information. And if women aren't happy with the information they get from you as a healthcare practitioner, they're gonna look elsewhere. So maybe have a few um, good reputable sites, because women love looking things up on the internet, where you can direct women to. Uh, I think the Royal Hospital for Women in Victoria has a few really good PDFs women can download. Um, and yeah, and then talk to the other women in the women's healthcare team and just, just try to keep the woman at the centre. And if using complementary medicine is part of her worldview and part of what she wants to do to help have the healthiest pregnancy and breastfeeding journey she can, then try to work with that. Does that answer your question, Jo? <laughs> yeah, I get a bit passionate about that. Uh, just checking. Just going to check. Does anybody else want to leap in and ask a question? Hi, Larissa. It's Kelly. Hi, Kelly. I just want to say I, I really enjoyed that and um, thank you so much. I do know, well, I, I feel very honoured to have sort of heard about this journey through the years and it's just so exciting to see that come together. And I just wanted to ask a bit of, from you as a researcher being through this, were there any highlights for you during this or any surprises that, that came up for you during this journey? Oh, thanks. For those of you who don't know, Kelly's one of my best friends and she's a fellow naturopath and PhD student as well. Um, so I guess what I'm constantly surprised by is the willingness of women to share their experiences, both in the qualitative research and in participating in a fairly long survey. Um, and their willingness to then share it with other people as well and encourage other people to join in. They really did want their voices heard, but I also feel, always feel so humbled and grateful that women took the time to do that. I think as well, during the um, five years, just working with that interdisciplinary team, what's been really surprising is I didn't expect to learn as much about the other healthcare professions I've worked with. So that has been really good. Um, what did you ask for? 
surprises and highlights. Um, yeah. To be honest, having these results from the survey is a bit of a highlight because this is going to shock you all, but I absolutely hated this survey. <laughs> When I was putting it together, I think I spent months crying every day over designing this bloody survey. And it really, really got me down. So then to have it come together as actually people, one, did it, and I had enough results to actually analyse and to get some really interesting stuff from, that's been, that's been definitely a high as well. Whereas I'm much more attuned to qualitative research, so I found that a lot easier. But, you know, we had a homeopathy lecturer once who loved to tell us that the, what you learn from the most is struggle. So I often think about Ian in that. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I'm trying to scroll through the, through the chat, but feel free to speak up because there's a lot of chat to... Oh yeah, Paris is just... Um, thanks, Paris. So she's just said, in addition to the slides, have a look at the publications I've put out. Um, and I'm not sure how to get those out, but if, if you go on Google Scholar and put my name in, you'll find them all there. <laughs> Does Parisa, um, did you want to make any comments? Or I'm not sure if Kirsten's online. Um, no, Larissa, other than that you did a brilliant presentation, um, explained everything very clearly. Um, and it's hard to put about three or four years worth of solid research <laughs> into half an hour uh, and present it. And so the papers are a great way of finding out more about what you've done and everyone to be on the lookout for the next three that Larissa is currently working on. Yeah. yeah. So, very well done. Thanks, Paris. And thanks for all your support over the last five years. It's been invaluable. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions? Um, someone's asked where he, where to from me professionally. Uh, okay, and Sandra's asked if there are any First Nations involved in First Nations women involved in my research. Um, some women did did tell me that they were um, Aboriginal, but because I didn't specifically ask that, I didn't report it. Because um, it, it, when you go through um, ethics applications, if you're actually going to start asking about Aboriginality, um, there's a whole extra level of ethics that you have to go through to make sure that it's culturally safe and safe for women to share and that you're not going to be abusing the information, etc. So yes, Sandra, there were some, but I didn't report on that. Um, in terms of the qualitative research, there were four women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Um, so they didn't have English as their first language. Um, with the survey, you did need to have a certain level of English to actually complete it. Um, but so we probably did exclude some women that weren't of um, in, in good enough English level to participate. So there is a need for more research in women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and language backgrounds, because we do know that in certain communities in Australia, for example, the use of traditional oriental medicine is quite high. Yeah, and there has been some research done um, in Melbourne around that. Yeah. Um, and where to from now? Well, I'm still working education team here. I love working at UCRH. I'm also working for Southern Cross, writing a unit on integrative women's health. Um, I'd really like to stay in the research and education field. And I'm passionate, as I said, about supporting women in their journeys. So I hope to continue to do that. Um, just scrolling through. Yeah, I can't see any. Thank you for all your lovely comments in the chat, by the way, everyone. Um, I'm great that, great that you've enjoyed the presentation and that you also feel that women are smart. Uh, I, think, I think at the beginning of this research, that maybe that answers Kelly's question a bit more. Um, there was a bit of a fear that women would be choosing complementary medicine products, maybe because they had a pretty label, maybe they didn't understand what they were taking, maybe they were um, doing things that were quite dangerous for the baby or themselves. Um, and so it was actually quite gratifying to find that women had very complex decision-making processes. The qualitative research actually delineates that quite specifically. And, um, and so you have a look at that if anyone's interested in that. So yeah, that was a lovely surprise. I mean, it wasn't a surprise to me because I think we're smart, but you know, it was nice to get it in a big sample. <laughs> okay. Um, was any final questions or? Can I just sure. can I just make another Please. comment? Yes. I, I the comprehensiveness and the thoroughness and the quality of what you've done is absolutely superb, Larissa. 
and, and really, I mean, I think I've supervised 45 PhD students, and I have to say yours is probably the best I've ever been involved oh in. <laughs> oh, truly. It is stunningly good. And the fact that you've got such a range of evidence is what's so important mm -hmm. because and to go to the survey, and I know it was a hideous job, absolutely hideous, and many people would have backed off and not really done it because you'd done lots of other stuff. But that gives it a solidity that's going to change the system, and that's what's really important. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to say congratulations. It's a stunning piece of work. Thank you so much, Leslie. That really means a lot from someone that's so experienced as well. And thanks for clapping, Kathy. <laughs> Well, I think that sounds like a very uh, nice way to finish the presentation. I think, Leslie, you've done a wonderful wrap up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. And I have to agree, it is a, it's a stunning piece of work. And um, thanks, yeah. Jackie. So congratulations. Thank um, you. <laughs> so thank you, Larissa, for taking the time for um, putting together this presentation. As we've, it's, it's been fantastic. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, just a, a reminder that the next seminar is on the 15th of October uh, and that one's looking at, again, just a little reminder of a framework to evaluate and understand access to healthcare in the Northern Rivers. So um, we hope to see you um, for that presentation also and, and just thanks everyone for your participation. It's great. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, thanks all. Bye. Bye.